In previous videos, we looked a bit into this Silynx Zinc based system on module. So essentially, a mix between a processor and FPGA. We have some DDR3 memory, QSBI, EMMC flash memory, buck converter, and so forth on a module that we can then plug into a carrier board using these mezzanine connectors. This board is still being produced and I have news that it should be with me fairly soon. So I started working on a carrier board for this system on module and you can see a very simple carrier board on the right here, also designed with Altium. I've imported the step file of my system on module just to make sure I can place the connectors correctly and all the spacings and everything fits nicely. While designing this system on module, I had to choose which peripherals I want to expose from this Zinc system on chip. And one of the main ones is USB high speed. Now the Zinc unfortunately doesn't include a high speed transceiver, but it connects via ULPI, which is a low pin count interface for USB 2 high speed to an external physical layer chip, such as the one on the carry board. So I had to route out from the Zinc through a mezzanine connector, which then goes through this carry board opposite gender connector into this USB high speed physical layer and then can connect to a USB connector. In this video, therefore, I'd like to show you some aspects to ULPI routing, length matching, and what you need to consider, for example, package delays, via delays, and so forth. If you're interested in the schematic design aspect of this system or module, I recommend watching my video number 50, titled FPGA and System on Chip Hardware Design. And this goes into a bit more detail of what you need to get a Zynix Zinc schematic up and running. As this is a fairly complex design, I chose to go with Altium Designer, which you see quite a bit in my videos these days, and I have several tutorials of how to use Altium Designer in depth. If you'd like to give Altium Designer a try for yourself, you can visit the link at altium.com forward slash yt forward slash Phil's lab and get yourself a free trial. The first thing I would always urge you to do when starting routing or designing for a certain interface or new interface is reading some design guides, which you can easily Google. I'm using one by Microchip or SMSC called the ULPI Design Guide. I'm using this because the actual physical layer chip I'm using is by Microchip. It's a USB 3320. One of these documents will tell you about the pin interface, how it interfaces with system on chip, what the data signals are, clock signals, directions, and so forth. Initially, we all might think ULPI clocks are fairly slow at 60 megahertz, but of course you have to take signal rise times and fall times into account and you will still have to adhere to some certain timing margins, even though 60 megahertz by default would, would, wouldn't sound that hard. We have eight different data signals, a clock signal, direction signal, and these two other control signals, SDP and NXT. And these will all hook up between your physical layer IC, as well as your system on chip or whatever device you're using that requires USB high speed. The most typical configuration is USB ULPI clock out, which means the USB transceiver IC, or rather the physical layer chip, will provide the clock signal to the system on chip, and on the other side will connect to the USB connector. So I'd urge you to read this document. There's quite a few pages to it, but it tells you some interesting things about this ULPI interface, and this is fairly common in many designs. What we need to worry about is controlled impedance traces. We want to minimize reflections, possibly termination, or series termination resistors, as well as length and skew matching. And this document will tell you all about that. In particular, I'd recommend looking at section 5.1 on ULP timing, because there are various setup and hold times and relationships between clocks and data and so on. And this will be important when calculating, for example, the maximum allowed trace length we can have for this ULPI interface. And I'll show you that in just a second. We also need some other data sheets and other bits of information before we can start routing our ULPI interface. This is the data sheet for the USB 3320, which is the my chosen physical layer chip for the carrier board. This tells you all the things you need to design the schematic, as well as set up hold times, various time parameters, and so on. So of course, you'll need the actual layout and pinout, and then also a schematic. And this is pretty much what I copied over into my design. What we'll need in just a second is this ULP interface timing on this data sheet, which tells us in ULPI output clock mode, which is what we'll typically go with the setup, hold, and output delay times in nanoseconds over here. And we'll get back to that in just a second. The Zinc chip I'm using is an XC7Z007S, so one of the most basic Zinc ICs, just to make a fairly inexpensive system on module. With that information in hand, we can go to the Zinc 7000 series system on chip DC and AC switching characteristics datasheet. In this datasheet, you will also find a section on ULPI interfaces. And remember, this will depend on which system on chip, which process you're using, you have to find the relevant section in the relevant datasheet or reference manual. It so happens that for my chip, in this case, 
I can find it in this document. And we'll need these parameters over here that you set up on hold times for the actual system or module because we'll need that in combination with the physical layer IC to give us our timing margins. Lastly, to then calculate our timing margins, for example, our maximum PCB trace delay, I highly recommend this Versal ACAP PCB design user guide from Xilinx, which is UG863. Scrolling down fairly far, we can see the USB 2 section and the ULPI interface. Now this mentions the Versal quite a bit, but this is, specific, this is not specific to this, this interface. We need to find all of these definitions, and you can find all of these definitions from the data sheets I've just shown you. For example, the clock period, which in ULPI case is you know, 1 over 60 megahertz, so about 16.7 nanoseconds. And then you need all of these various clock to output delay, setup and hold time and so on. And these are exactly the numbers you get from the two data sheets. So one from the physical layer and one from your system on chip. Then what you all need to do, of course, it would be nice to actually go and understand properly. But for the sake of time, let's just use the formulas down here. We can plug in numbers to get, for example, the maximum PCB trace delay, minimum PCB trace delay, and maximum allowed SKUs. What I'll show you how to calculate is the maximum PCB trace delay. So we need our setup time from the physical layer, our ULPI clock period, which is 16.7 nanoseconds, and the clock to output delay of our system on chip. So the setup time is simply this parameter here, which is a minimum of five nanoseconds. So we have our setup time. The clock period was one over 60 megahertz, so 16.7 nanoseconds. And the clock to output delay of the zinc chip, and we have the maximum, that's 8.86 nanoseconds, as we can see here. Then we just have to do the clock period, which is 16.7 nanoseconds, minus 8.86, which was the clock to output delay of the zinc, minus the setup time, which is five nanoseconds. And then we just have to divide that number by two, and that gives us a maximum trace delay of 1.42 nanoseconds. So all I've done with this calculation is simply rearrange this formula down here for maximum PCB trace delay. So 1.4 nanoseconds is the maximum allowed PCB trace delay we have for any of these traces. So that's something to keep in mind. And 1.4 nanoseconds, you know, isn't long, but isn't short either. So we're pretty safe. So this is the main bit of information we need. And then we also need skew between the different signals. So we have a maximum PCB trace delay we're allowed now, but the skew between any of the data direction or these control signals and the clock should be within 50 picoseconds. With those two items in mind, so having the skew between the traces, as well as the maximum PCB trace delay, you're usually pretty safe when routing ULPI interface. But make sure to check the minimum trace delay and any of these other skews as well. But then again, ULPI is a fairly forgiving interface. Now that we have some parameters in mind, our skew should be 50 picoseconds, maximum trace delay 1.42 nanoseconds, we can move over to Altium Designer to actually then check out the routing and what other things we need to take into account. Firstly, going back to our system on module, we can't just worry about trace delays, we also have to worry about package, via delays, and so on. So if I press 2, go into my 2D mode, and zoom in on my system on chip, my zinc system on chip, if I click on one of these pads, on the right side in the properties tab, you can see I have a propagation delay, which is set to 180.7 picoseconds. Now this wasn't in this package by default, I've actually added this propagation delay. So from the internal die of this chip, via the wire bonds in this case, this will add some propagation delay, which we have to take into account because this is actually fairly significant. You know, this is about 0.2 nanoseconds, and this might add up. And remember we had 50 picoseconds of maximum allowed skew, between traces. So while this propagation delay might be 181 picoseconds, another propagation delay might be 160 picoseconds, and so on. And they vary quite a bit. The question is, how do we get these propagation delays? For Xilinx chips, it's actually quite straightforward. You need to install Vivado, which is the main programming tool or configuration tool for Xilinx FPGAs and system on chips. I've really created a project. I've chosen my relevant IC and I've selected my pin out. After you select your pin out, and this of course depends on your situation, you need to synthesize to get essentially a floor plan model. Once you have that, and you can open the implementation, you can go to file, export, export IO ports. And this will generate a comma separated value file, or CSV file for short, which lists the delays. I've already edited one and opened this here, and typically they'll give you the pin number, which bank it's in, the type of pad it is, and so on. But what's important for our case is the minimum and maximum trace delays given these columns here. I've added an additional column where I'm just averaging the delay, so adding min to max, dividing by two, and this is what I then use to input and out to Altium Designer as my package delays. 
in A5 might have a package delay of 96.5 picoseconds on average. If I want to add a propagation delay one of my pads, I have to select my main IC, unlock primitives, click on the pad I want to change, and then I can enter the propagation delay on the properties panel. So for example, 10 picoseconds, this has included this propagation delay in this pad. And this will be useful because Altium Designer counts the propagation delay from pads, vias, and traces for you. And I'll show you that in just a second. To see propagation delays, we go to the bottom left on PCB, and you can either look at all of your nets, but I've also created net classes. For example, for the bank 501 of the zinc chip, I can click on this, and I can see, if I expand this, the delay in one of these columns. Now, because of the space constraints, I couldn't match all of these delays to be the same length, and this, of course, has to be taken account when we design the carry board. But nicely enough, this delay figure includes my trace length, and includes my pad delays as well. The problem is it doesn't include via delays. So if I click on a via, you can see the propagation delay is zero picoseconds. And the question is, what do you do for that? One method of doing it is routing all of your signals of the same group, all using the same topology. So all going through one via at least, all going through the same amount of vias, all without vias and so on. This way, any Z axis movement doesn't have to be accounted for. The other way is simply assuming that the path that the signal travels through the via is the same as a strip line, and I got this information from Rick Hartley. So you just assume it's the same as traveling through a strip line trace, and then you add that on top, and then include that as the via delay. And this, of course, depends on which layer we go from and to, and that'll determine your length through a strip line and use the dielectric material of the internal of your PCB. Now, here we can move on to the carrier board. So after we've accounted for the delays, propagation delays in the main system module, which plugs in here, we also, of course, have to then length match on the carrier board itself. Once we've accounted for all of the system on module propagation delays, we've made sure we've calculated for vias, pads, and so on, we can move over to our dev board, or rather our carrier board. Here we have to do the same thing, and that's why you see all these squeaky lines, because these are accounting for delays and making sure we stay within that 50 picosecond skew. We also have to add up our delays of our carrier board and the system module to make sure we are below those 1.42 nanoseconds of maximum trace delay. And as you saw before, we had about 250 picoseconds and about 200 to 300 picoseconds here. So we're well below 1.42 nanoseconds. So that's why it's fairly forgiven. To then do my length matching in Altium, if I click on one of these traces, I've used root interactive length tuning. And once you do that, you can then click on these traces, drag up and down, and this will then change your delay. So I've used this in addition with this property panel here to adjust my delays, make sure we match the ULPI specifications. I also, of course, tried to keep clearance between these trombones so we don't need to minimize our crosstalk. You can also see here, every time I have a trough, I do a trough on the other side as well to make sure, you know, we're not doing a trough meets peak and we get closer distance between these traces. So make sure even while you're doing length matching that you keep, you know, fairly adequate spacing between these traces. One thing we haven't touched on yet is of course impedance control. When you're routing a ULPI interface, we need to make sure these traces are routed to spec and that's typically 45 ohms plus minus 10%, but typically I will just route my traces as 50 ohms. Because I'm using JLC PCB to have this dev board manufactured, I can simply use the controlled impedance calculator. So I can open that up. I'm simply using a four layer board and I want an impedance value of 50 ohms. Four layers, I've got a 1.6 millimeter thickness, outer layer and it's single ended. I can click here on this arrow and then I get two recommended trace widths and that depends on if you're using, depends on which build up you're using. I'm actually using this JLC3313 because this gives me thin dielectrics and gets me get away with a thinner trace space. So 5.78 mil is about 0.15 millimeters. If we go back to my design and look at the trace width in the properties panel, it's 0.15 millimeter trace width. This is of course assuming a solid ground plane as a reference directly below. So layer one would be signals, layer two would be ground to make sure I have a proper reference. Now this board isn't entirely done yet. I'm still doing the final touches, for example, stitching the ears and so forth are still missing and just cleaning up the design a tiny bit. If you want to use Altium to calculate your trace widths for controlled impedance, you can go to design, layer stack manager, but then you have to enter the build up into this layer stack manager. Going to JLC, we can actually look at the stack up by clicking on view stack up. We can find the dielectric constants and prefrag types. And for the JLC 3313 stack, which I'm using, this is the information you need with thicknesses which you then import into Altum Designer, and this is what I've done as well. In Altum Designer, you can go to Impedance, 
at the bottom tab here, and you can see Altium includes a 2D field solver, so if I type my width as 0.15 millimeters, Altium thinks this is about an impedance of 51 ohms, which is very close to 50 ohms, pretty much confirms what we thought. So thank you very much for watching this short overview of ULPI routing. Remember, package via trace delays, matching the specification, timing requirements, controlled impedance, and maintaining spaces between traces. Other than those aspects, ULPI is a pretty straightforward interface to route anytime you need USB high speed. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next time.